When I was in Bible college training for the ministry, we were given an assignment that I thought was a little bit different for an evangelical Bible college or for when I was in a Pentecostal Bible college. We were introduced in class to something called the Apostles' Creed, which at that point in my Christian life I had never heard of before. And our assignment was to memorize it and be able to write it out as a quiz the following class. When I began working for Youth for Christ here in Port Hope, oh my goodness, 18 years ago, and I started on a routine of every, because I didn't have any Sunday responsibilities with Youth for Christ because all of our work was with youth during the week, I would go around to a different church in Port Hope every Sunday and visit. And it's kind of how I got to know you guys from the beginning. And because we have two Anglican churches in town, I ended up going to Anglican services probably seven or eight times a year. And I really learned to appreciate the way they do a church service and, and the spiritual depths of many of, depth of many of the readings that they do every Sunday. And I discovered one thing that Anglicans do almost every Sunday is they recite the Apostles' Creed together. Webster describes, describes a creed as a belief, a doctrine, or a dogma. When written out in a series of statements, a, a creed expresses the basics of the belief, belief system of a person, an organization, a religion, or a church. A creed spells out the non-negotiables. It may not cover everything in the belief system, but it covers the basic elements that define a church, that define a religion. There may be more to a religion than what's in a creed, but there's not less. If you took away any of the elements of a creed, then the creed would cease to accurately describe the religion or the faith. And in the early days of Christianity, when literacy was not widespread and only very, very few were educated, um, deep discussions on teachings of theology would be lost on most people. There's a modern business concept called the KISS principle. You know what the KISS principle is? K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. Well, the early church knew that in order for what it meant to be a Christian to be understood by the masses, they needed to keep it simple. To express the basics of belief in a simple, memorizable creed. In the days of early Christianity, there were, there were many false teachers. There were leaders who were, you know, they were fairly well respected and they gained a following, but their teachings started to kind of go off track. They started to deviate from the teachings of Christ. In fact, many of Paul's letters in the New Testament, many of his epistles were letters that he would write to churches in order to address false teaching that was going on in their church that was taking root and spreading. A number of the writings of the early church fathers were often called against so-and-so, against Celsus or against Pelagius or different people. They felt the need to write a theological treatise to come against the teachings of another church leader who was deviating away from orthodox belief and was drawing a flock and drawing them away from the church. So the early church felt the need to create this template, a simple statement of belief, a creed that would bring together the basic doctrines of the church. It wasn't meant to be scripture. It wasn't meant to replace scripture. It was a man-made attempt to sum up all the important doctrines of the Christian faith in one statement that people could use to, to test any teachings they heard that they might have thought, well, that's a little bit off-center there. So if anyone came along teaching anything that was opposite of anything in the creed, the church would know from the get-go that this teaching was false and was not to be followed. Creeds began to develop early in church in Christian history, the first inkling of what we, saw, what we know as the Apostles' Creed, what we read together, was found in a writing dating from 390 AD. And the creed, in the basic form we know it today, dates back to 710 AD. And to this day, this ancient creed is, is recited regularly, if not weekly, in Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist churches, among others. It's not really a part of Baptist or Pentecostal or evangelical tradition, although it is in our hymn book, I discovered. I think that's why Professor Stevenson wanted us to memorize the Apostles' Creed when we were back in soteriology class. Sometimes Protestants feel that the Christian world and church history began with Martin Luther and the, and the Reformation, or it began with the founding of our particular denomination. 
But when we think like that, we lose out on a, on a rich history and a rich theology that, that we can learn from, from cent- decades and centuries ago, and that we can apply today. So that's why we're going to take some time in the coming weeks to look at the Apostles' Creed. Because there's a lot that we can learn from, from digging in, even a little bit, into these basic statements of the church. For we live in a world today, especially in North America and Europe, that many writers are calling a post-Christian world. Many people around us do not even have a basic knowledge, a basic knowledge of what Christianity is all about. And there are many in society and even in the church who, who might identify themselves as Christian, and yet they'd be hard-pressed to explain exactly what that means. They would have difficulty explaining what it is about a Christian worldview, a, a Christian belief system that is different from any other worldview and any other religion. And yes, Christianity is different from other religions. The religions of the world are not all the same. I've learned in my ministry over the years never to assume And as such, I don't want to assume that we all have a grasp of the foundational truths of the Christian faith that that are touched on in this creed. I don't want to assume that we all understand and and could explain to someone else what it means to, to have Christian beliefs or to be a Christian. So we're going to spend a number of weeks looking at the various pieces of the Apostles' Creed together. What it is that we believe as Christians and hopefully understand it better so that we can apply it to our lives today in 2018. So to start things off, we want to briefly look at the very first statement in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. What does it mean to understand God as Father? First, I want to acknowledge, so I don't get accused of plagiarism, that a number of my points come from the, the writings of two theologians. J.I. Packer was an evangelical Anglican theologian who taught for many years at Regent College in British Columbia. And I had the privilege of hearing him when he spoke in Montreal, went back in my university days. And he wrote a book called Knowing God, which I've picked at over the years, never read from cover to cover, but um, I've gleaned some information from that. And George Ladd is the other theologian. He's a professor of theology at Fuller Seminary in California. Now, the first thing to understand about God as Father is this is not a universal statement. The concept of the brotherhood of mankind, the idea that God is the Father of us all by the fact that he created us, is not a biblical concept. Now, the image of God exists in all human creation, but the concept of fatherhood, as understood in Scripture, is a concept of adoption, not creation. We are not naturally born into the family of God. We, it's not something we just take on by, by birthright or by osmosis. We are adopted into the family of God, and it is an adoption that we receive by faith. John 1.12 tells us that to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not out of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. As one author has written, the family of God is not something you're born into, it's something you're born again into. Over my years of working with young adults and and youth, I've come across a few times where a young woman will become pregnant, and for whatever reason, the father is gone. It may have been a decision he made to take off and not take on his responsibilities. It may be that the mother, realizing what the father is like, wants no part of him, doesn't want him influencing her child's life. But whatever the reason, the father is completely absent. Now, biologically, that man is the father of the child. But in reality, he has not taken on any of the responsibilities of a father. He's not given to the child any of the benefits of having a father. He has not earned the right to receive the respect due a father. He has a biological connection to the family, but he's not really part of the family. And there are millions of people in this world who have, if you will, a biological connection to God in that he created them. They have what theologians call the imago Dei, the image of God stamped on their souls. Yet God is not their father, for they have not entered into God's family by receiving his son, by believing on his name, by accepting God's deep desire to welcome them home and adopt them into his family. 
Packer defines a Christian as someone who has God for his or her father. Not God as his creator, not God as some impersonal force that cannot be known or cannot be related to, not God as a concept or as a, a set of doctrines or beliefs. A Christian is someone who has God as her father. Packer goes on to say, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and of having God as his father. Now, for some of us, the thought of God as father is not an encouraging thought or even a welcoming thought. We might have had a father who was absent. We may have had an earthly father who was maybe even abusive. We may have had an earthly father who was distant and did not provide the affection that we needed. We might have had a father who was self-centered and didn't provide the protection we needed as a child or especially as a teenager. Our view of the word father may be profoundly colored by our life experiences, whether they be good or bad. And that's why we need to step back from it and understand what it means to have God as a father and how that might differ from what we've experienced in life. If considering God as a father is supposed to be a hallmark of what it means to be a Christian, then then how do we understand what it means for God to be our father? Packer writes that we can see the relationship that God wants us to have wants to have with us as father and child by looking at the relationship we see in scripture between God the Father and Jesus the Son. And one aspect of that relationship is is authority. There is an authority inherent with the title father. Now, for some who have had fathers abuse their authority in different ways, this concept can be very uncomfortable, maybe even frightening. But Jesus said in scripture that his purpose on earth was to do the will of the one who sent him. Obedience to God's will was non-negotiable for Jesus in his life. Jesus obeyed his father and he bowed to his authority. Jesus, I've often said before, Jesus was the only 200% person in history. He was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. He was fully God. He possessed all the attributes of God. And yet he, he was very much seen as a man by most, most of the time when he walked on earth. He only used his divine attributes when God the Father allowed him to. He only used them in accordance with the Father's will. Now, this concept of authority is not what we hear sometimes where a father or someone in authority might say, do do as I say, don't do as I do. I've heard that. Or it's not, you know, do it because I said so. Why? Because I said so. It's not a pulling of rank kind of thing. It's not an authority we're talking about here that's lorded over us or imposed upon us against our will. We willingly come under the authority of God, our Father, because we know that he loves us because we know that his purposes for our lives are only good all the time. We know that he wants the best for us. And we know from experience that obeying God brings out the best outcomes in our lives. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. His love for us is is bountiful, it's generous, it's poured out without end. Because he loves us, because he wants the best for us, because he sees the big picture in our lives and knows what is best for us, we, acknowledging God as our Father, are pleased to obey him, are pleased to follow him. In our human lives, there's a great joy in doing something that makes our Father proud of us, that pleases our Father. And being a part of God's family means that we accept his authority. It means that we have a responsibility to obey him. It means that we will do all we can to make him proud, to make him smile. Now, often we associate the concept of authority with fear. Our perception of authority is often like a a dictatorship. That's not what it means to have God as our father. Richard read earlier from Romans 8, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Abba, Father. Now this isn't Abba, the 70s Swedish pop group. We're not talking about that. 
You know, Mamma Mia was not one of their big hits. I, don't, I had ABBA's greatest hits. I don't even remember it being on there. Now everybody thinks Mamma Mia, ABBA. But that's not the ABBA we're talking about. ABBA is an Aramaic word. Arama- Aramaic was the language that Jesus spoke. And it's a word that Jesus used in his prayers to God the Father. And here in Romans, and again in Galatians, Paul is saying that this is the term that we can use when we address God. Now, Abba is a term of familiarity. It was an informal term that children would use in addressing their father at home. It's roughly the equivalent in English to dad or daddy. Now, some theologians caution against going too far with this informal language, but it is clear that Jesus is introducing a whole new way of seeing God. The Jews would never think of using Abba in the synagogue as a way to address God. George Ladd writes, The Jews did not ordinarily use this word in their address to God, for it was too intimate and would have seemed disrespectful. Abba represents a new relationship of confidence and intimacy imparted to men and women by Jesus. Our relationship with God the Father is to be characterized by confidence and intimacy. Confidence. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and receive mercy and receive help in our time of need. Knowing God as Father brings confidence. It's a confidence that we're never alone. It's a confidence that we will have all that we need whenever we need it. It's a confidence that God will provide. It's a confidence that even when things seem to be spinning out of control, that God is in control. And he has all things. He has us in his care. This was a theme that was strong throughout this book. Even amidst the the numerous setbacks that he experienced in his recovery and trying to get back to play baseball, he learned that God was in control. And whatever God wanted for his life was going to be fine with him. He can trust God to make something good out of difficult circumstances and difficult situations. Even as humans, when we are in trouble or in difficulty, there is a feeling of great relief that comes over us when dad shows up. You know, we're troubled, something's going on, and all of a sudden, dad's there. It's like, oh, good. This is, things are going to be okay now. Dad's here. And God's ability to provide and care and protect is even greater than the best human father. We can have full confidence in God, our father. We can say in difficult times, oh, good, Dad's here. Confidence and intimacy. Sometimes when I talk with younger people about their fathers and they talk about him being distant, the question I'll often ask them is, was he an old school type of guy? For in the times past, men were taught to be stoic, to not show their emotions, and by extension, to not make much of an outward show of affection or of love. I have two two, uh, female friends back in Montreal who are twins, and they said that when they were little girls back in the 50s, I guess it was, if they were walking with their dad, um, he would hold them by their wrists rather than by their hands. Their relationship was extremely formal. But God is our Abba. He's our father, but he's also our dad. He desires a relationship that is close. You can talk to God about anything. He wants to know what's on your mind. He wants to know what's on your heart. He wants to know your hopes. He wants to know your dreams, your fears, your joys. He cares about you and he's concerned about your life, every aspect of it, big or small. He wants to take you by the hand, not by the wrist, and walk with you through every part of your life. The times that bring great joy, that bring great fulfillment, and the times that bring sadness and emptiness. God is your father, yes, but he is also your Abba, your dad. Because God is our father, we as his children are our heirs. Verse 17 of Romans 8 says, Now if we are God's children, we are also his heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in in his sufferings in order that we might share in his glory. Sometimes I think we sell ourselves short. I know I do sometimes. When we consider our relationship with God, and the impact that he can have on our lives. 
We are his children, and as such, we are his heirs. Everything that belongs to God belongs to us. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to walk around like some snooty rich kid, you know, looking down on everybody. But what it does mean is that the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the power of God are available to us, his children, to enable us to get through the storms of life and to give give us the strength to do his will, to accomplish his will in our lives. And the concept of heirs also has a future promise. God, our heavenly father, desires to share his eternal home with his children. As heirs of the father, we have a hope, or even better yet, we have a confidence that this life here is not all that there is, that God has promised to prepare a place for his children where we can experience God the Father in ways that will just blow your mind and that go beyond anything we can possibly imagine. So as we more fully understand what it means to have God as our Father, we understand that it involves authority, it involves confidence, it involves intimacy, it involves an inheritance, and finally it gives us an identity. It gives us an identity. So much of growing in life is figuring out who we are. What is our identity? We talked a couple of weeks ago how young people and older people too are finding their identity, defining themselves as homosexual or lesbian or transgender. We talked last week about divorce and and how that causes children to take a hit when it comes to to finding their identity because so much of that search is, is rooted in family. When family is broken, so is that safe place to figure out, hey, who am I? What's my identity? We can find our identity sometimes in how we look on the outside. For some, it's important to just look together, you know, to have the right clothes, to make sure our makeup's on point, to to fit in with those around us. We can find our identity in our job or our profession. When we meet someone, what's our first question? It's not, well, who are you? It's, well, what do you do? And we figure when we find that out, we find out all there is to know about a person. We can even find our identity in being a parent, which is why the first couple of years of being an empty nester is so difficult. We can place our identity in the books we read, the sports teams we cheer for, go Habs go. We can find our identity in the hobbies we pursue, in the area of the country we live in. Are we a city person, a country person, a small town person? But above all that, the truth is that if you've received Christ as your savior, if you've placed your faith in him, if you have been adopted into the family of God, then God is your father and you are our God's child. And more than anything else, that is your identity. You are no longer fatherless, no longer feeling without protection and guidance. You are a child of God. You are no longer uncertain about your future here or in eternity, for you are a child of God. You are no longer trying to be good enough to earn love and acceptance because you are a child of God. You are no longer a slave to fear. You are a child of God. You are no longer a slave to your impulses, to your temptations, to what society says you are. You are a child of God. And when you begin to fully understand that, when you begin to see yourself and see your world through that truth, then everything else becomes so much clearer. And if you find yourself today knowing that God is your father in the sense that he created you, but you haven't become part of his family yet, you, haven't, you don't know him as Abba, as dad, well, God is here. God is waiting. He wants to be your father. He wants to help you find your identity, find what it is you were created for, why you're on this earth. And you can leave today knowing that you are a child of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, just so that we can focus on God and not be distracted. Maybe you're here today, and and we were saying towards the end there, maybe that's you. Maybe you understand God created you. You believe there is a God kind of think you know about him but you don't have that relationship where you can say he's your dad where you can say that you have confidence 
and his protection over your life where you can say that he has authority over aspects of all aspects of your life where you can say that that your identity is in him you can go from being a creation of god to a child of god simply by accepting his desire his offer to be adopted into his family and as ruth was showing on the screen before it's about dealing with our sin where we've missed the mark and it's about accepting god's forgiveness how he's and his desire to wash our sin away and it's as simple as saying god i'm sorry I'm sorry for the ways that i've missed the mark in my life i'm sorry for the ways i've i've been rebellious i'm sorry for the ways i've done things my own way i've always kind of known you're there but i haven't really let you into my life and so lord please forgive me please wash away my sin take away the the, all the wrong that I've done. Make me clean on the inside. God, I want to be part of your family. I want to be your child. I want to be adopted into your family. If you pray a prayer like that and mean it with all your heart, then you got yourself a new dad. And you are a child of God. Lord, I thank you for being our Father. And I pray, Lord, for those of us who've known you for a while, whether it's for a few weeks or for many years, that you would just remind us again of how close you want to be in our lives, how much you want to be a Father who loves and protects and guides and directs and encourages and nurtures. Lord, I pray that we would not keep you at arm's length Thank you, Lord, that you are not an absentee father. It's us who become absent sometimes. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to see you more and more as father, as dad, as someone who is near. Thank you, Lord, for making us part of your family. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to bring many more into that knowledge and into that adoption. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.